there's a subtle mistake that sometimes people make. Sometimes it's easy to do because most of us want to, in some way, somehow, keep track or to have a way to evaluate whether or not what we're doing is good, bad, or otherwise. You know, is it effective? Is it producing the most results? Am I getting return on my investment? Is it an actual benefit to me personally to be doing what I'm doing? <laughs> you know, I hear that a lot. Oh no, they don't say it that way. They don't mean it that way. But really, when you boil it down, it comes down to really counting the numbers. How many people are really saved? How many people have attended church today? How many people are coming to witness my sermon or my teaching? Humanity, in and of itself, seeks to elevate itself. We call it manifest destiny in some ways because there's this idea that somehow man can manifest good. Somehow we can make ourselves better. You know, we really think we can on our own. But the reality is if you leave two guys together and they get a plan, believe me, it doesn't necessarily mean things are going to get better. Somebody somewhere is going to pay a price. And that's the point that most people don't count the cost of the long-term effect as opposed to a short-term result. Oh, I can get what I want now. Who cares about what it might cost me later? But if I get it now, ooh, ah, ee. And America, especially in our culture, as opposed to some other nations that have been around a lot longer than we have, who have seen failures in short-term thinking, well, America, we like short-term results. We like to see it happen now. We like instant drive-through. We like instant soup, instant oatmeal, you know, instant pleasure, instant results. Hmm. We like to get what we got and get it now. It doesn't work spiritually that way. You see, a lot of times people don't realize that what they thought of as good now turns out to be really bad later. It putrefies, it turns sour, and deteriorates after time. And that's something that we as especially American Christians need to take a hard cold look at what we're doing sometimes when we're trying to evaluate ourselves, our ministry, or what we're doing for God. Because I was smiling today, I read an article that was uh, Greg Laurie, a friend of mine, I mean I don't know him personally that well. I got saved, you know, from his church, and it was neat way back when, you know, and I've watched him, you know, and I've seen him at different times, you know, kind of waved a few times, you know, way back, you know, I mean, little things, but nothing, you know, like sat down and went for coffee or something, you know. <laughs> and I have gone to coffee with some of these guys, you know, but not Greg, you know. But anyways, <coughs> the point being is that Greg mentioned something about in an article, you know, and I'm sure I kind of caught his heart, you know, and his tenderness and in some perspective, but he said that how we really don't know how to evangelize, you know. And I thought about that and I went, wow, man, to hear Greg kind of like say something like that's kind of surprising. But it brought me to kind of talk to God about it a little bit, you know, to really sit back and say, well, Lord, you know, where what are we doing here, you know? What, what's going on? You know, and one of the mistakes that's made a lot of times in ministry is that pastors, evangelists, teachers, maybe even you, maybe me, we get into numbers, you know. God warned the children of Israel not to number themselves, not to do a census, not to count themselves, because he knew that pride would enter in and that somehow, some way, people would begin to stumble along the way and he has his own reasons for not wanting us to count ourselves. But people like to keep track of how many salvations were there? Who gave what? How much money did they give? How much tithing? How much did we get on our budget? 
we need to plan so we have to have you know a handle on these things don't we <laughs> you see that's a good question because would you notice miraculous if there was a bank error or would you notice miraculous if that basket you pulled out of when you put in only ten dollars came out a hundred dollars now the interesting question would be if the fish could be so multiplied could not likewise could God do the same I mean sure he could do it in a bank but more than likely you're not going to get it <laughs> so I wonder sometimes you know with this whole idea of you know like the Evangelical Christian Federation of Accountants you know and all this stuff where they keep track of every little detail maybe God isn't in the details of counting salvations maybe God doesn't treat that reality of getting bigger is better because in reality when you think about ministry the opposite is true we should be decreasing in order that he may be increasing what huh what do I mean by that well you see Jesus was pretty accomplished he's a great speaker yeah really no he was a great speaker he could get thousands of people to show up at any point in time matter of fact he could go way out in the boonies you know and thousands of people would go out they'd even go three days journey just to hear him talk great speaker he could pull a crowd together he could also drive a crowd off because <laughs> he had a way of saying things that kind of oops when it was time he put the hammer down <laughs> and people had to deal with it you know kind of like personally all of a sudden the message came home and that's the reality sometimes of what we don't do in American Christianity is there's always this idea of growing bigger is better but what happened to smaller is quality or the smaller you use for instance like I'll give you an example in gardening one of the Japanese techniques of gardening is to see a fruit and to grow that one fruit on the branch not ten fruit the one fruit that is so golden, so delicious, so full of moisture and content that it takes all the sustenance from that branch and it produces one juicy morsel of fruit that is just far beyond ten shallow fruits that wouldn't have produced much at all. You see, the one quality was worth the ten of lesser esteem. That's what God seeks to do when he said many are called but few are chosen. Ministry should be about the reduction and not the increase of numbers. We should always be looking at improving those people and giving them the tools and the quality skills of developing their personal relationship to such a degree that they would be likened unto the twelve disciples because Jesus didn't need a campus, he didn't need a television, he didn't need a televangelist, he didn't need a radio, he didn't need anything really. As a matter of fact, he did it himself when the twelve kind of abandoned him. But the point being is he had twelve that God the Father chose for him and said, These are the ones. These are the ones, including the one that you're gonna, you know, kinda like he's gonna, you know, go bye bye. You know, but I still got one in mind, you know, down the road, but you'll see. You'll figure it out. So he picks them, hand picks them and says, These are the ones I want you to use. So Jesus commits to them and anoints them and tells them, you are my friends, you are my disciples, you are my apostles. And they became that. And so the quality of the 120 was all the same, but God chose 12. The quality of the 70 was all the same, but God chose 12. There were a lot of people that followed Jesus daily. I mean, really, and kept the ministry going, and they worked hard. I mean, Martha, you know, she's she's running around there doing her work. So is Mary. <coughs> and yet, God, the Father, reduced it to 12. And that's the point. You don't want to get obsessed when numbers increase, because Proverbs teaches us, hey, you know, when, when riches increase, or when numbers increase, or when your ministry gets bigger, don't don't put your mind on it. Don't set your heart on it. Don't get affected by it. Stay focused on what you are called to do. One of the things about Vidivo that we've been very, very, very focused in on, if but for one, that I can share in the name of the Son, 
and relate Jesus in a personal and intimate way, then just for one, I will do it that I might hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because if I can do it for one, then I can do it for a thousand. But if I can't do it for one, I can't do it for a thousand. You see, it's more important the one person gets a handle on what's being said than thousands of people hear something that tickles their ears and then they leave and just forget about it. That's one thing that happens a lot on the internet. People will like, you know, they click these little like buttons as though that does something for them doesn't do a thing. Most of the time, I'll say probably 90%, even though I hate those kind of posters that say, oh, 90% of the people probably won't share this, but if you share this, then you know, you're going to get blessed and you're going to get this, that, and the other thing. That's a bunch of baloney. The reality of what human nature is, is that most people on the internet will click something and just pass it on without ever really looking at it or getting a handle on it. I make sure that the title has something that I can get somebody's attention so maybe they'll get a little bit of scripture in it. But most people will not look at whatever it is you're passing around on the internet. They'll just pass it on. Yeah, it just feels, you know, it's kind of fun to click it, click it, click it, click it. And that's what a lot of people do. That's why texting for them is so much fun. They're using their thumbs. That's why gamers are so good at texting because they're using their thumbs. Believe it or not, these little individual idiosyncrasies that you could call them uh, ergonomically designed you know um, addictions really catch on and it does get to be kind of like you know see my thumbs moving yeah it kind of gets to be like you know kind of you know you get trapped into that you know just... kind of like you know with the remote control funny how that's changed lifestyles and changed people around from what they used to do isn't it and that's what Christianity has unfortunately infected a lot of people because you see these churches going mega size rather than downsize and Jesus was the opposite Jesus downsized so that he could influence and cause to change the world if you want to change the world really if you want to be effective in the ministry downsize don't get bigger get smaller John the Baptist was called the greatest of all prophets born a man by Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. Me personally, I think if you kind of stacked him up against, you know, Elijah or Elisha or, you know, like Moses or somebody else, you know, somebody that's either prophet and partial prophet or whatever, you kind of go, well, I don't think John was that big a deal. Well, interesting the way that we evaluate what a big deal is compared to what God evaluates as a big deal. Jesus said of those born of women there was no greater than John. That's amazing to me because then that means I gotta look at something different because John didn't have a lot of disciples. Oh some people followed him and they came to be baptized but they kinda got baptized and ran off because this guy was wacko. I mean, he was out there in the desert, you know, eating locusts and wild honey, you know, and wearing skins. If you don't know what that's like, go down to some street people, you know, and go eat some food for a while. Go, go break a meal with, you know, somebody who's on the street. Or maybe an alcoholic. You know, go down to Skid Row, you know, and see what it's like. Hey, pass the bottle, man. Wipe it off. Take a, show, take a swig. That's kind of what eating with John would be like, you know. Wild locusts and honey? I don't think so. <laughs> Survivalists know it's not exactly you know the way I want to go, but that's kind of what John the Baptist was like. He was way out there in a cave, and kind of looking a little like wacko. And so Jesus says, "No greater." Interesting. Maybe we evaluate things the wrong way. Maybe because John had downsized the world, God upsized him for the kingdom of heaven. Think about that downsizing the world in you so that you could upsize the kingdom of heaven. The people that are most dependent upon God usually are the ones that are being used by God in a dramatic fashion or have some experience that is really phenomenal. I know for myself, <coughs> when I started telling people that I heard Jesus speak audibly, they thought I was nuts. And you know, I thought they were nuts because I thought they automatically heard Jesus speak. I thought all that time that I was running around, you know, with all these Jesus freaks, they automatically heard God talk to them every day. 
I kind of figured that's what they did, you know. I was shocked. I said, well, how did you get so joyful? How peaceful and loving, you know? And they said, well, because I read my Bible. I said, well, okay, well, I read my Bible, you know. But then God talks to me too. <laughs> it's like, oh, oops. I wasn't supposed to hear. Okay, now I can hear. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, God, because I was so removed from the church, because it didn't visit me when I was suffering and dying in a hospital bed, there weren't these visitations going on, not quite what you think of as today as a going on ministry. No, in those days it was kind of like, you know, still kind of getting the healthy people saved, you know, kind of sick people were like on their own, especially handicapped people. Ooh, that's come a long ways, baby, in the last 20 or 30 years, but <laughs> thank God for that. <coughs> but the point is, when you're dependent upon God for your life, then you're like the poor in spirit because you're crying out to God almost every day just to take a breath because the pain is so great. You're crying out to God for your drinking the water just so you can hold it down. You're crying out to God because you're 89 pounds or less and you look like if you turn sideways nobody would see you. You're pretty ashamed to call yourself a Christian and yet God is not ashamed to love on you and to give you special blessings that only you and He enjoys. So downsizing the world is something that we all have to do in our lives. We have to downsize some of the things that are affecting us from the world because it's infecting us with a disease that could kill us. It's called worldliness. And sometimes that's the way that Christianity has become. Pretty worldly, you know? Kind of like, you know, let's build a stage like the rock stars. Let's have a concert like, you know, American Idol and let's bring all the people in, you know, and have them scream and shout. Well, the last time I saw people screaming and shouting kind of like at an American Idol thing, I kept thinking of like Brownsville or wherever that was, you know, Toronto experience where people were rolling around on the floor barking like dogs and claiming it's God. I don't want that kind of expansion. I'd rather have a reduction and take maybe a few people in an upper room and wait and see what really the Holy Spirit can do. Because me personally, when I look at the book of Acts, I don't see dogs barking. I don't see people rolling around on floors. I do see Peter telling and witnessing the gospel and sharing like he's never shared before. I do see a confidence and a manifestation of God in a person in such a way that the world was amazed, that they were shocked by how intelligent and how smart these people had become. I kind of think about, wow, where did I get my learning from? And my sister argues with me constantly over this. And I said, look, when I got saved, I got everything I needed. Boom, it all came to me. I said, I'm just sharpening the skills. I said, I haven't really studied or applied or memorized or done anything. I said, I had it all when I got saved. Boom. God says, here, you need it, go get it. Ran out and started witnessing. I didn't even read the Bible yet. How did I know those scriptures? Now, I know what it is now. Word of, walk, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, you know gift of prophecy, all these kind of weird things happening all at the same time, and I'm kind of going, I don't know, I'm just sharing Jesus, you know, I'm just talking about Jesus, I want to tell people about Jesus, this is the greatest thing that happened to me in my life, you know, I went on and on and on and on and on, <laughs> I was a nut, <laughs> and I loved it, I love talking about God, I'm like, God, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, you know, God, tell me more, and I go do it, and I was like, cool, but the sad part, I think, about this upsizing, is that people are, like, upgrading and trying to always build a bigger, better church. You know, a bigger, better mousetrap. They're trying to revamp, revise, and somehow con the world into the church. Why? I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't want the church to have the world in it. I like being with God. And if somebody wants to find out what that's like, they can come see me. Hey, I got it. You don't got it? Oh, sorry. You don't want it? No problem. Go away. In other words, we should be downsizing like Jesus did with his disciples to make quality what we have rather than trying to get more than what we got. The never-failing God 
For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What line does my thought take? Does it turn to what God says or to what I fear most? Am I a success or am I a failure in God's eyes? Am I learning to say not what God says, but to say something after what I have heard about what he says? Oh, well, the pastor said, oh, Joe Blow said, oh, well, you know, Chuck Smith says, oh, well, you know, C.H. Spurgeon says, oh, well, Tozer says. But what did God say to me or to you? And what am I willing to stand on? To say something after what I have heard, what he says, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Is that true? Or is that just something you heard said and you don't know how it's to be done? I will in no wise fail you. Not for all my sin and selfishness and stubbornness and waywardness. Have I really let God say to me that he will never fail me nor forsake me? Or am I always trying to be good, do good, and act good so he doesn't leave me or forsake me? If I have listened to this say-so of God's, then let me listen to him again more intimately. Neither will I in any wise forsake you. I will not leave you nor forsake you in any way, shape, or form. Sometimes it is not difficulty that makes me think God will forsake me, but drudgery. The same old thing over and over again. There is no hill difficulty to climb, no vision given, nothing wonderful or beautiful, just a commonplace day in and day out. Can I hear God say so in these mundane things I'm doing? I gotta take care of the kids, I gotta go to work, I gotta, you know, wake up, I gotta get dressed, I gotta put on my makeup, I gotta put on my clothes, you know, I gotta shave. We have the idea that God is going to do some exceptional thing that he is preparing and fitting us for some extraordinary thing by and by. But as we grow and as we go on in grace, we find that God is glorifying himself here, now, today, even in shaving, which I need to go do. <laughs> in the present minute, God is speaking. In the present tense, God is. As he is, so we are. We need to be aware that God is always with us and never leaves us and that God is with us no matter where we go and what we do and all we say and all we be. I like to tell my wife in everything, especially in the morning when she has to hear constitutional. You know what a constitutional is? If you don't, think about old people. <laughs> Milk a mag. Okay. God is there. God is everywhere. God is always with you. If I make my bed in heaven or make my bed in hell, David said, you are there. God is always with us. We need to be aware of that so that we can be there with Him. So that we can be constant in prayer and in conversation, always recognizing that God is there. <laughs> and He loves us anyways. Isn't that amazing? The most amazing strength comes when we learn to sing in the ordinary days and the ordinary ways in all the ordinary things that we go through every day. So it's not about building some great sanctuary and saying let's fill it full of thousands of people and get millions of people to come and oh wow that night was special and then every day after that for 360 days because those five days of revival were wonderful now we have to wait for 360 days because we don't like the everyday things we don't like the normal things we don't like to walk with God in the everyday things of life that we have to do or that we choose to do or do we? Martha was busy about a lot of things because she wanted to make it extra special for Jesus when he came. But Jesus said, hey, you know, Martha, you're worried about a lot of things. But Mary's doing what she needs to do. And that's being with me. I'm not stopping you from doing what you're doing, but I'm right here. So you can involve me in it. Or you could do it for me or with me. I pray that when you give your utmost of all that you have, of all that you are, and all that you want to be, you don't forsake the little things like cleaning toilets, picking up cigarette butts, 
doing the very smallest and littlest of details for one person, only one person, even if that's your wife, your child, your daughter, your son, your grandfather, your grandmother, whoever it may be, if you forsake that one little thing, you've missed the greatest thing of all. For Jesus sees in the midst of that and he says, look, Father, and the Father looks down and sees those things that are done in secret and rewards you openly for those things of the menial that no one else knows except God alone and rewards you openly and blesses you because you were faithful to him in committing that extra simple, stupid, dumb little thing you're doing that you feel isn't significant, but which God says is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven.